Hello. I hope 2024 is going well for you so far and that you've been reading some good things. I'd love to hear about the very first books that you read this year. I want to discuss everything that I read in January, just giving a brief summary and some thoughts and feelings about these different books because I read nine different books and I've started reading a tenth. Uh, there's a whole mixture of some older books, um, there's some newer novels. Some of these books I read for different book clubs, some I read for a special reading project, and others I read just because I fancied them. <laughs> so, starting off with a novel that was just published this month called The House of Broken Bricks by Fiona Williams. This is a novel about a family. It revolves between their four different perspectives. Um, they live in a very rural area of England in a, a small community where everybody kind of knows everybody else's business. And I loved the sense that it gave over the course of the novel for the environment and for the individual family members' lives as we see their different perspectives and um, how they're all going through their own individual issues, but also as a family unit there, they experienced a, a crisis and they're trying to work through this. And uh, the, 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 um, the, the way, the language that she uses in this um, to, to portray um, the, the nature around them, but also the, the mother of the family, um, Tess, um, she bakes a lot. So there's a lot of sensory experience in this novel that um, I really appreciated and was really beautiful to, to read about, but also getting into their feelings and, and their um, different psychologies over time because because um, there's also a big kind of secret in this novel. There's um, what I guess you could call a twist or a kind of reveal um, about this family, but it's done um, in a really clever way um, that uh, I found really effective and uh, very emotional as well. And so it is a novel about belonging and family and grief and race uh, because uh, the the mother of the family, um, Tess, she is black and the father Richard, um, he's white. Um, he comes from this rural area but she um, grew up in London and she has Jamaican heritage and they have twin sons, um, but one of their sons um, has much darker skin and one has much lighter skin. So um, it's about their contrasting experiences and um, what the reactions of people that they encounter, um, what that says, uh, you know, about attitudes um, regarding race and um, and how people are perceived. Um, so. Yeah, I thought I thought this was really well done, and um, and how the the novel opens up um, to show how um, it's really diff difficult in families when everyone has their own individual goals for what they want in life, but then trying to work together as a family to accomplish those individual goals while trying to support one another as a family is really difficult. And, um, and so I, I just thought that was really beautifully conveyed. And uh, yeah, this was, this was a really wonderful novel and a great book um, to, to read. Then um, with uh, my physical book club um, that we meet every um, couple months or so, one and a half or so months, um, we read a, a very short older novel by Christopher Isherwood called Prater Violet. And uh, this was first published in 1945. And um, the protagonist of this novel is Christopher Isherwood himself, but it's a fictional story about um, him getting into the movie business. And it's mainly um, between the main character of Christopher Isherwood and the director of a film um, that Isherwood starts 
writing um, the, the script for. So it begins very much as a kind of comic novel um, in which Isherwood is sucked into the movie business um, where he gets a phone call telling him that um, he's been hired for this job and it's like, oh no, I don't even want the job and he tells his family he's not going to take it. But then he is lured into um, writing the script for a film, um, partly for the money and I think partly because of the, the glamour of getting into the film business. And we, and we see comically um, him getting drawn into this, but also his experiences with the director, um, who's an Austrian director, who's, um, who's very respectable. And um, both of these individuals have high artistic ideals, um, which um, don't uh, do very well in the, the movie business, which is very much about the business and the practicality of trying to put a motion picture together. And so, um, so we see how their, they, their egos have to deal um, with this kind of film environment. And, um, but then it becomes a much more serious book because it's set in the mid thirties um, in London and England. And, um, and so there is the rumblings of war. And um, this was a period when the, the Nazis um, first started um, invading Austria. And, um, and because the, the director is Austrian, um, this obviously affects him and he grows very worried about his family. And so you, you get um, small pieces uh, about the war and um, this sense, it's not directing dealing so directly with the politics of, of war or, um, or the, uh, the historical experience of it, but more how that's viewed from the side when we're an individual that's caught up in this moment of history and sort of viewing that um, f f and caring about that and wanting to be involved in that, but, um, but having no direct experience of it. And so it's, um, it's kind of ju issue we're judging um, how to negotiate that as an individual when you see news of, of war occurring like this. And it feels very much like he's reflecting back on this time since this was published in 1945 when World War II had just ended. And then he's reflecting back on this experience in the mid thirties um, when war was very much on the horizon and developing over a period of, of years. and. Um, and so, yeah, I feel like that's the real crux of the novel and point of the novel. And it builds up to this reflection of that experience. Um, but it feels like an oddly truncated novel in some ways. Like he, um, he starts talking about some things, but then doesn't deal with them very fully. And um, so I, it, um, it was a really interesting experience reading this. And it's a kind of um, interesting sliver from this period of, of history. But as a novel as a whole, I don't know if it was entirely satisfying in a way that um, I would hope that a, a f fiction that I read would be. Um, but uh, it, I found it really interesting reading about how this was Isherwood's first novel that he had read, uh, that he had written um, in, in almost a decade because he had um, stopped publishing fiction in the mid, um, the mid uh, to late 30s when um, he started engaging in a translation project of the Bhagavad Gita, um, which took him many years and he got much more interested in spirituality. So to to go back to this kind of what begins as a comedy of manners and then turns into a much more political statement is, um, yeah, a really interesting um, development for his career. And, uh, and also, I really enjoyed how there was a brief mention in this novel of W. Somerset Mom and how um, a producer wanted to um, hire Mom to, um, to, to write this um, film project for Greta Garbo. And, um, and so it made me interested of what Isherwood's relationship was to mom because they were writing and publishing and around the same time and I assume moving in similar literary circles. Um, so yeah, I'd like to read up more about Isherwood's life. Um, then I read an older novel um, by Muriel Spark called The Driver's Seat, um, which is a very short novel, a very strange um, book. It's a kind of 
It's, um, it's not exactly a who done it, but a why done it. And in the novel, um, it's termed as a why done it because um, we follow um, a woman's experience as um, she, she works at a very dull job and she decides to go on a holiday and, um, and she begins with her purchasing this very colorful dress or starting to purchase a dress she decides not to purchase it because then the assistant says that it's stain resistant and um, and she gets very offended by this notion that she is someone that would spill things on her clothes and um, and so it has this kind of dark comic tone to it but we learn very on that um, she is going to be killed and um, and so that's why it's more of a why done it than a who done it because we know that she's going to be murdered but we we don't know why or the reasons um, for it or really the reasons for her holiday because um, she behaves very erratically and um, and so it's like she's taking control of her own fate and um, trying to direct her life but she doesn't know exactly what she wants um, it seems she seems to be very impulsive and um, and she's um, very emotional in how she reacts to, to things and um, so it's a it's a really it's really interesting following her journey and her experiences um, with um, different men she encounters and um, and but then we see that police are interviewing people that she encountered over this time before she was killed and so yeah there's a whole mystery element to it but it's very the the voice of it is so compelling and so different and um, and mural spark has this way of considering mortality and our lives um, from a very unique point of view that does have this slightly humorous tone to it, which is very entertaining to, to read. So yeah, I really enjoyed um, reading this novel. And also I saw the film version of it um, because um, at Christmas, um, my husband very kindly got me a whole group of Elizabeth Taylor movies. So we've been steadily watching these different films of uh, Elizabeth Taylor. And I'd seen a number of her movies before, but um, never these particular movies. So yeah, The Driver's Seat, um, which was um, strangely also called Identikit, I think in some different countries. Um, and so Elizabeth Taylor portrays um, this this um, this curious character, and um, and she really gets the manic energy of this character, and it's um, really interesting seeing this film and contrasting it to the novel because the film actually stays fairly close to the novel. Um, so yeah, I, I really enjoyed reading that. Um, I also read an older novel um, called um, which was published in the '90s, I think the midnight mid '90s, um, called Lies of Science by Brian Moore. And it's a novel set in Northern Ireland, in Belfast, in a quite large hotel and follows the main character who's the manager of this hotel. And quite early on in the novel, the IRA invade his home and hold him and his wife at gunpoint and order him to drive a car which is fitted out with a bomb to the hotel. And then they tell him to walk away. And he's able to drive the car up to the hotel because um, he is the manager. So he's just kind of waved through when everyone else who um, enters the premises, um, their, their cars have to be searched um, because uh, tensions were very high about the sectarian conflict. And so, um, so it's about this crisis point of what is he going to do? And, um, and it's very tense um, following um, his journey and what he decides to do in the aftermath of that. And um, so, yeah, I, I thought this was such a, a gripping story. Um, it's told in quite a straightforward way that's really easy to, to read, but also it gets into the, the subtle difficulties of this conflict and um, this, this moral crisis that he faces um, in this moment of time, because he's somebody who's not especially political and doesn't really want to be involved and um, and really doesn't want to live in Northern Ireland, but he's just found himself 
there. And so he's going through a, a personal crisis as well as this larger um, crisis that he finds himself in. And uh, and so, yeah, I, I really um, enjoyed this novel and I've never read anything by Brian Moore before, but he's a really interesting Irish author. I think he died in 1999, but he wrote several novels. So I want to explore more of uh, his work. And then I reread uh, a novel which um, I'd read quite a long time ago, um, but wanted to familiarize myself again with, which is Graham Swift's novel, Waterland, um, which is such an epic, um, really powerful story um, a about a man who's a history teacher, but um, he's gradually being made redundant. And um, we get the speeches that he gives to his class, um, which become increasingly personal, talking about um, his own personal um, history, but but also the history of the er the rural area that he grew up in. Um, so his father was a, a lock master and on a river, and um, he um, he regulated um, the the water and uh, and we um, but we but we see how he grew up in this kind of marshland, um, and you feel like the the whole area is just saturated with water, and that's blended into the story in such a, a beautiful way. And, um, and there's many different mysteries um, to his personal history and to the, the, the history of the area. And those are gradually uncovered as he's um, giving these lectures to his class. And, um, but then he's also going through um, some uh, crisis in the present time as, as well um, to do with his wife. And, um, and so how this looks at the past and history and our relationship to it and our understanding of in it with it and our own involvement um, with the the past um, is really beautifully done and uh, and so yeah and I, I thought this was um, such compelling storytelling um, but but also the the prose of it is um, is so powerful and um, and really rich um, in in how it's written and uh, and this is I think I, I've only read a couple of novels by Graham Swift, so I want to um, explore more of his work because, yeah, he's published um, quite a lot, but I think this is one of um, his masterpieces and the way the story comes to a head at the end is, is so gripping and powerful and surprising. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's a book that even though I read it quite a while ago, I'd forgotten um, uh, quite a lot of it. And so I'm re-experiencing it in it this in this way um, was such a pleasure. Uh, I, I also um, read uh, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer by, um, by, uh, by who wrote it? Mark Twain, of course. And, uh, and this is a book that I, I read in my childhood, I think, or like a, a shortened version of the book. And um, so this is for a much larger project that I'm sort of building up to and that I wanted to um, also reread um, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn in anticipation of Percival Everett's novel, James, um, which takes the, the character of Jim um, from uh, Huckleberry Finn, but who's first introduced in The Adventures of Tom Sawyer and um, gives his version of the story. And, uh, and this was such a pleasure to re-experience. I mean, it's the, uh, I, the ultimate kind of boy's story about lovable scamp uh, Tom Sawyer, um, who has a number of different schemes, and uh, and we follow um, his different adventures and. Uh, and uh, obviously there are some antiquated things uh, about this book, especially to do um, with race, um, to do with, uh, with Jim when he's introduced and the, the way he is um, portrayed, but especially of the character of Injun Joe, um, who's a kind of antagonist or villain of the story and um, who um, engages in a number of different criminal activity and how Tom Sawyer becomes involved in that. And, uh, and it's a kind of inflated fantasy of um, the adventures that he goes on and uh, the very dramatic things that he witnesses and gets involved with. And um, so it's this kind of blending of um, what, uh, what a boy's, uh, kind of typical boy's life 
a kind of like wish fulfillment in in this way because I feel like a lot of boys wish that their their childhoods were this dramatic as Tom Sawyer's is. Um, a, a lot of ours wasn't, but also it's just looking in a in a very fun way about um, how a boy's life just actually is of of uh, having the tension of um, of trying to be made to go to school and to become a, a gentleman when really he just wants to go out and play and have adventures. So it was very fun to to read this story and certainly there are some antiquated things about it but also there are some things about it which for the time were probably quite progressive in how it was portrayed. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll be looking forward um, to going on to the um, to Huckleberry Finn um, because because uh, yeah, because Jim was first introduced in this book in quite a short chapter, and um, so it'll be interesting to see how his character develops as well as the uh, the the uh, character of Huck um, himself. Um, then I, I read a, a recent novel, Northwoods, by Daniel Mason, which has gotten so much attention, and I read it alongside my book club, and uh, this was such a great reading experience. I'm um, looking at a house in New England over a period of centuries, and all of the people that, differ that inhabited it over time and passed through it, and the many different stories, and how those different personal stories intersected with the history of the area, but also the larger history and things that were going on in the community and the country and the world around them and um, and how he subtly works those larger things into these more personal stories and tells their stories through a number of different styles and using different techniques of storytelling and different mediums. So there's some like maps and there are some ballads um, which are uh, represented in the the book and different documents and um, which really give a sense of the texture of, of history and um, what is left behind and these small pieces that are um, that remain and what this says about the larger stories from the past which of course we can't know all that much about by just seeing these individual objects or these different documents um, but how um, how there's really great stories behind them and we can get small pieces of that but never fully know it and um, and how he builds this sense of the layering of these stories um, through the portrayal of, of ghosts so there's a whole supernatural twist to the story um, which is um, which becomes really pleasurable and I think some people find it a bit gimmicky um, how that's introduced into the story but uh, but I because it he was building this larger sense of the story and this portrayal of history. Um, I thought it was really effective and um, yeah, just such an enjoyable story and such a, such a pleasure to, to read. Uh, I also read C. Pam Jane's um, recent novel, Land of Milk and Honey, um, which is another novel so much about food, and, um, and, and, but not in especially a, a good way because some of the food portrayed in it is quite nauseating, um, but then some of the other food is like, quite delectable. And so it's negotiating of what we desire and what we crave and um, what, we, what we hunger for and looking at those different feelings and this interesting way through this kind of uh, breakdown of society in the world when uh, smog covers the world and and decimates a lot of crops so leads to a lot of starvation and hunger and political turmoil and a country which is formed by the super elite and a woman who becomes a chef in this newly formed country and um, who has to negotiate her position in it by sublimating to the powers that be and um, and what that what sacrifices need to be made for that and um, and how she gradually understands over time what she really wants in life and um, what is actually manageable given the circumstances of the crisis of what is going on in the world and it's told in this retrospective position where we know that she survived um, but we don't know what has happened to this country and what has happened in the larger world and what has happened in her personal relationship because she gets involved in uh, a relationship with the the daughter of the man who founded this country 
And, uh, and yeah, I, I thought this was、um, really interesting and unique. And,、um, but also,、um, yeah, I just loved its portrayal of food and、um, gave this very democratic sense of, of food that we might crave foods which、um, might not be good for us, but,、um, but that, we,、um, that still give a lot of pleasure to, to life. And,、uh, and I really enjoyed that aspect of the book. And、um, the, the very first book I read this year was Anne Enright's recent novel, The Wren, the Wren, looking at a family through three different generations, mainly focusing on、uh, a woman who's the granddaughter, a young woman who's trying to figure out what she wants in her life.、Um, she, uh, she writes features、uh, about traveling around, although she herself isn't, hasn't traveled、um, very much. In, in the world. So there's this like wonderful irony to her side of the, the story. It reminds me of that, that,、um, that great Christmas film, Christmas in Connecticut,、um, starring Barbara Stanwyck,、um, where she's a food writer,、um, but she doesn't know how to cook. And, um, and uh, so there's this whole like fantasy and、um, allusion to、uh, the, um, this character's life and、uh, a kind of like falseness.、Um, but then later on in the book, she does actually go travel.、Um, but then it's also about her mother and her, her mother's life, who never married.、Um, she, she had a daughter out of wedlock and,、um, and has lived very independently and following her perspective as well. But also、um, how these two figures live kind of under the shadow of、uh, the, the mother's father,、um, the, who's a kind of patriarchal figure and who is a famous poet. And,、um, and his poems are interspersed with their narrative and、um, how we get pieces of his story through their different narratives. And how this gradually begins to reflect more on his poetry、um, is really interesting. And、um, so it, it shows how family members can, be,、um, can live under the shadow of these different generations, and especially from a very、uh, strong patriarchal figure、um, who had、um, this like, image of himself and image that he wanted to portray about his life and his family, which Kind、of clashed with the actual experience of the, the family themselves. And、um, so, yeah, it's a really interesting way of exploring masculinity and,、um, and the, the lives of different women and、um, different family members and the, the function of family and the connections between family,、um, but also the dis- disconnections between them. And Anne Enright's writing is always just such a pleasure to read that、um, I really enjoyed、um, this as a, as a first. Reading experience for the year. And I've started reading Michael Cunningham's new novel called Day, which has just been published here in the UK this month. I think it was published in the US um, later um, last year. But, uh, but yeah, it was, it's just come out here and、um, it follows a, a family in、um, a household over a period of three different years, and,、um, but a single day from those. Different years, and it goes into、um, the recent pandemic. And so it's dealing with、um, how the expectations about how life are, is going to play out is very different from how it actually plays out because of circumstances to do with、um, our lives. So I'm in the first section and just getting this sensory experience of a few different characters' lives moving between their different perspectives of living in New York and,、um, and uh, yeah, they're. The, the different moments of their day,、um, but also their、um, yeah, different expectations of what's going to happen. And、um, yeah, I really enjoy Michael k e n n a m s writing so far. I mean, he's always been very inspired by Virginia Woolf. And again, this is, you know, has a very Mrs. Dalloway feel of kind of capturing moment to moment experience and、um, the consciousness of different characters as they're moving throughout their, their lives and how that intersects, you know, with. Um, what is occurring in the world around them. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to, to reading more of this and seeing how that progresses through the, the different years.、Um, so, those are all the books I, I read this 
this month. I'd love to know if you've read any of these titles and what you think about them, or if you're interested in reading any of them now, um, please let me know about that in the comments below. But yeah, I'd also love to hear about what you've read so far this year and in January. Um, please let me know about that. I, I'd love to discuss it with you. But I hope you're doing well and reading good things. I'll speak to you again soon. Bye-bye.